cool fact of the day is. Hey. Radio. 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 Bulletproof Radio. Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that it's no secret I love fat, but there's new research that says even high fat diets can be brain protective. And the theory behind this research is that fat, particularly medium chain triglycerides, gives the brain enough energy to trigger self repair. And the idea that your brain cells like ketones, especially the neurons, that it may give them the ability to repair themselves some more. So we don't know this for sure. It's just intriguing new research, but it's kind of cool. Today's episode is one of my favorite kinds and one of your favorite kinds too, because it's a Q and A episode. We get so many questions in online, and I don't do these as often as I would like because I really like the opportunity to do them in person with someone else rather than over Skype. So if you're watching this live, you probably noticed that I'm not in my normal studio. That's because I'm here in Tampa at JJ Virgin's Mindshare event. She brings together about 100 successful health influencers, people who are working to make everyone around us healthier, and I'm honored to be here. But it gave me an excuse to hang out with my buddy Zach. So Zach is gonna run through a bunch of your questions that you've submitted on Facebook, on YouTube, and on our blog posts, uh, just at the very bottom of the blog. If it's a podcast blog, there's a form that you can use to submit questions. So if you're listening to this and you wanna get one of your questions answered, submit it there and we track these things and then every time Zach and I sit down together, we go through and I'll answer them for you to the best of my ability. All right, Zach, let's do it, man. All right. Our first question comes from Baji. He says, hi Dave, I've been using your products for the last six months now. I just wanna ask, what is the difference between MCT oil, XCT oil, and brain octane? All right, so this is a thinly veiled, is this actually a question from someone? This isn't like a marketing question? <laughs> no, this is a straight, uh, right. actually we got a bunch of the same questions. Okay. People wanna know. All right, it's good. <laughs> so MCTs, are if you look at this like from a, a marketing perspective, there's four kinds of MCTs. And the coconut oil companies will say, oh look, this is 62% MCT, but they're lying to you because the richest so-called MCT that's in coconut oil is called lauric acid. And it's the predominant fatty acid like that in coconut oil, there's just one problem. It doesn't get processed by the liver like a medium chain triglyceride, it gets processed like a long chain triglyceride. So you can get away with selling lauric acid as a medium chain triglyceride, even though it's a lie. It's not a medium chain triglyceride. It doesn't work that way. Now, lauric acid's good for you, but it's dirt cheap. It's called eat coconut oil because like half of coconut oil is lauric acid. So I recommend eating coconut oil as a way to get that one MCT. So there's four kinds of MCTs that different companies will, will try and sell as, as you know, real MCT, just like coconut oil companies, but you're not getting the pure stuff that we're using for metabolic activation. Now, so that's plain MCT. There's also problems with just normal commodity MCT that have to do with something called C17. And I wrote about this in, in the Bulletproof Diet book. C17 is an odd chain fat that's made by less pure processes and if you've ever had severe disaster pants after using commodity MCT, there's a reason for that. And some of it comes from cosmetic machines, some of it's imported from China, but most of it has this C17, which causes the gastro distress that happens. And you get much less of that from XCT oil. Now, XCT oil is the two shortest lengths, and it's not all four of the MCTs, it's just two of them. It's the C8 and the C10. XCT oil, which used to be called upgraded MCT oil, that stuff is distilled an extra time more than normal MCTs that you'd find on the market. And it's that extra step of distillation and filtering that gets rid of the C17 and the other contaminants so it doesn't have the same level of GI distress. Disaster pants becomes much less of an issue. XCT oil is more affordable because it has the C8 and the C10. And that means you can, you can afford to have it. And it's roughly six times stronger than coconut oil. When you look at the GI distress though, it is harder on the stomach than pure C8, which is our brain octane oil. Brain octane oil is about 6% of what's in coconut oil. Brain octane goes to energy fastest in the body. So when you take that stuff, you feel it up here first. It's literally octane for your brain. When you take XCT oil, 
you still get some of the C8, which goes to the brain quickly. The C10 takes more time to get in. So you don't get as big of a boost, but it still works. And compared to putting, say, coconut oil, which is what you put in just plain butter coffee that's not bulletproof coffee, you're getting 6% <laughs> brain octane oil in that. And, and that's why there's such a big difference between, in the book I write about, here's how to make like commodity butter coffee. Like you can throw whatever you want in there and, and you can get some benefit. If you put any fat, even corn oil, which I seriously don't recommend, if you put that in your coffee and you blend it up, well, it's not gonna taste that good for one thing, but at least you're not binding the antioxidants. Coffee has these polyphenols and these catechins. These things are important for your health. And if you put milk in there, the protein from the milk sticks to them and then you, get, you don't get them. There are studies that show a 340% reduction in antioxidants that are bioavailable just by adding milk. So any kind of fat would be an improvement, including just coconut oil, including even non-organic like corn-fed butter. But okay, that's not anywhere near Bulletproof. And Bulletproof is brain octane or XCT oil, grass-fed butter, which preferably is cultured and unsalted, and the culturing helps to reduce casein even more. And then you add in um, the, this XCT or brain octane, and that's what gives you like, wow, something just happened in my day. So hopefully that's a good difference. Yeah, and so when you talk about people that are making a decision about, I wanna get XCT or brain octane, what are the tangible benefits from a physiological standpoint you, that they can expect? From you get faster and more for your brain. Okay when you're doing C8 versus C10, but you save a few dollars. And one of the things that's really important to me, I don't think high performance is, is for rich people. Uh, I am willing to invest more, and I always have been, even when I was you know, living paycheck to paycheck, which I had for a lot longer than I'd like to have been, uh, I would prioritize my health. And I'd spend money on the things that made me perform well and feel good because it's a long-term investment. Like you can put a little bit in now, or you can like pay your cardiac surgeon later. Uh, but I, I do my best to make things affordable and both of those things will work for Bulletproof Coffee and you feel different than if you have coconut oil or you're putting in a bunch of lauric acid and thinking you're getting the benefits of an, a medium chain triglyceride. You're not. Eat some coconut oil, get some lauric acid because lauric acid has some antimicrobial effects. Like it's a good thing. It's just not a medium chain in the, the technical definition of what medium chains do. If it goes through the liver, it's not medium chain uh, the way we're using it for biohacking. Fair enough. Okay. The next question comes from John. It says, Dave, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on chiropractic work. This seems to be one of the most popular yet less, uh, least associated biohacks and has a good deal of promotion and criticism for its health benefits. So your opinion on chiropractic? You know, chiropractic is it's kind of like doctors. Are doctors good or doctors bad? I don't know, which doctor are we talking about? So the school of, of uh, or the, the study of chiropractic care is such a broad spectrum. I know chiropractors who are basically practicing anti-aging stuff. And I know others, or maybe I wouldn't want to go there because they're sort of really aggressive in their treatments. I've had profound benefits from, from chiropractic work. And I know countless other people who have, that said, to say that this enormous body of study is good or bad is, it's incredibly simplistic. Like there are amazing chiropractors who are very quantitative in their analysis. And there are others who, who frankly probably aren't helping. The same is true if you go into any medical clinic of any kind of medicine. So I, I would never say, I think that the entire study of, of chiropractic is useless. It's not. Now, one of the things that I find really interesting is that you can take a very, very sensitive, uh, basically thermometer, and you can run it down the spine. And this is a relatively old thing you could do as a, a chiropractor. And when you run it down the spine, the, what they call subluxations, areas where the spine isn't aligned properly, you'll actually get a small, like a 0.1 or 0.2 degree Fahrenheit difference between those vertebra and other ones. And funny, those are the same ones they'll find with their fingers. So why is there heat there? And well, okay, something's maybe happening. But then 
you go in a little bit more and you say, all right, maybe you don't need to do any work there. Maybe you do. So what would tell us whether it works? Well, you could do clinical studies. And there are clinical studies that show chiropractic works. There are also some that show it doesn't work. You know, I might add that it could be a question of the patient. It could be a question of the chiropractor. It could be a question of the diagnosis. It could be a question of the study authors. But I've seen huge benefits. In fact, one of the things that was most profound when my son Alan was born, he was, for the first five days of life, he had a, a rough time. It was pretty tight coming out. Apparently, that happens when you're born. And he would sit there, and he'd lay on his back. He'd only sleep for 20 minutes, and his right shoulder was up, and he was kind of a little bit like the right side of his face was scrunched a little bit. And he looked like he was in pain. So it just so happens that one of our, uh, one of my friends, one of our family friends is a guy named Dr. Peter Fish. And Dr. Fish has lectured at medical schools around the world. He's a, a pediatric chiropractor. He's gone around and he's taught doctors in ICUs for infants how to raise oxygen levels in babies by basically lightly, lightly touching a spot on the back of their neck because they have this little crick in their neck that lowers their oxygen levels. This is biohacking. In fact, Dr. Fish used to be a computer programmer before he got into chiropractic. Love the guy. So Dr. Fish, if you're watching, kudos, man. So anyhow, Alan's there, and Dr. Fish put his hand behind Alan's right shoulder, just, just barely touched it, the lightest touch. And literally, Alan melted into the table, and he slept for eight hours straight, and he stopped moving that weird way, he stopped crying. So I've seen this happen. Um, I've had adjustments myself that were enormously useful. If you watch the podcast with Jeff Spencer, Jeff is basically the team doctor for multiple Tour de France teams where he keeps them healthy. He's also a chiropractor. He gave me an adjustment because something happened uh, at the Bulletproof conference where like, I, something was wrong with my back and he fixed it. it. It won't fix everything. I don't think chiropractic care is that likely to fix a broken bone or a tumor, but can it functionally help you move better? Hell yeah. And so it's okay to be skeptical of anything. You should be skeptical of any healthcare provider until you see their track record and their abilities and you see if it works. But to throw out that entire school of medicine because you're skeptical, you're not doing yourself any favors. Good answer. And I, my personal experience with chiropractic is very quantitative. My doctor in Portland, Dr. Guthrie, who you've been adjusted by, I don't, she actually does all those tests, like the thermometer on your back, checks your posture, they, they measure your feet to see how your arches are. They actually do an HRV test also. And then I get those done every three months to track the progress. So I can point to the data for myself that it's really improved uh, over the times that I've been doing it. So I, I can't say enough good things about chiropractic if you have the right doctor. Yeah. Okay, the next question comes from Beth. And she says, I have a copper IUD, and I'm curious what birth control is the most bulletproof? Wow. So, some people don't know that you know, the first book that I worked on with uh, my wife, Dr. Lana, the fertility specialist, was a book on fertility. It's the Better Baby book. So the best birth control you could possibly have is learn when you're ovulating. Learn when you're going to ovulate. There are very predictable changes in the female body. You can look at mucus, you can look at changes in temperature, there are various apps, there's calendars, and if you're in tune with your body, you will know this. And, and here's a weird little trick. If you sleep in a blacked out room the way I recommend, if when the moon is full, you open the curtain and that night, you don't get that much sleep with a full moon because you're getting a light in your window. But your body will start to synchronize your cycles with the moon the way they would have if you lived in a cave. And that can actually help you predict when you're going to ovulate. But if you know when you're going to ovulate, the simple thing to do is use a condom around that time or just avoid, uh, avoid having sex when you're ovulating. That's hard to do because when you're ovulating, you're actually horny. And also men around you know you're ovulating through subtle biological signals like pheromones. And then we keep trying to have sex with you. So I would rely on the backup method uh, during that time. Now, what about IUDs? So I think IUDs, there's a case for them. But IUDs also can trigger some autoimmunity in some cases. And there's some cancer risks. And I would look very carefully at the research behind the one you're looking at using to see what, what studies have been done, how long has it been used, and what are the risk factors that go with it. There can also be clotting things, and IUDs can get lost. 
uh, but they can be a, a safe method of birth control. And they can also be better for you, a lot better than the birth control pill. And I will tell you flat out, if you're on the birth control pill, you should get off of the birth control pill for your health, for your breast cancer risk, especially your breast cancer risk. And the other thing that's just terrible, if you're taking the birth control pill, it influences your ability to smell a good prospective mate. And it sounds a bit weird, but there's good science behind this. So we use pheromones, and basically you'll choose a mate who is biologically more likely to be compatible with you based on how he smells. If you take the pill, you can't smell a proper biological match. And this actually happens, where you're on the pill, you meet someone, you fall in love, you get married, you decide to have kids, you go off the pill, and suddenly the person you married doesn't smell right. You're not physically attracted to them anymore. So this is the nitty gritty of biohacking, but the pill not only raises your cancer risks substantially, it also means that you're less likely to pick the right person. So from a health perspective, like allow your body to do what it's supposed to do, become aware of it, and then be extra careful with a backup method like a condom or a condom and even a spermicide. And there can be risks from spermicides. You don't want those inside you all the time. But if it's the time of life where you don't want to get pregnant, okay, fine, do that. But to take a pill every day or to use an IUD, if it's an IUD that is, um, that is one, and there are many that are associated with problems, you should watch out for that. And there are a few other methods you can use. Um, and basically, some of those things are, oh man, I'm blanking on it. It's the end of a long day. Um, the ring that goes over your cervix, the diaphragm. See, no one, in my, no one I know actually has ever used a diaphragm, but you read about these things. And <laughs> apparently, the diaphragm, from the studies that I read during the creation of the Better Baby book, the diaphragm is a, a, a safe and an effective and actually quite useful and uh, a, a good method of birth control, but not one that's that widely used anymore. So that may be something that's worth investigating, whether a diaphragm or an IUD is better. I don't know, at least I haven't seen any studies that say that, and there might have been something in the last three years since I put together the Better Baby book that's changed, but I would lean as far away from the pill as I could and lean more towards what I suppose you could call the rhythm method, but it's not a rhythm, it's the biohacker method. What's going on with my body? Am I about to ovulate? Am I expecting it to happen? Things like that, and that's pretty safe. And just if it's in that week when it might happen, use a condom, you're totally, you're totally golden and you're safe. Okay. <clears throat> this next question is about protein and it's from Jonathan and he says, Dave, I recently have been using the Bulletproof grass-fed collagen protein, and I noticed that the actual grams of protein per serving were only uh, seven grams per serving. And I've always been told that in order to put on a lot more muscle weight, one needs to consume around 25 grams of protein per serving three times a day. Is this true? And also, uh, he suffers from chronic tendonitis uh, and was wondering if you know collagen protein is a good choice other uh, over other proteins um, for his joints? So a serving size is something that's entirely variable. I went with seven grams because that's a tablespoon. So if you want 25 grams, let's see, seven times four is 28 grams. So you basically use four tablespoons. And it could have easily said serving size four tablespoons, but then people want less. It, it's kind of if you're bigger, you eat more protein. If you're smaller, you eat less protein. But if you want to get the benefits of using collagen for skin hydration and collagen for allowing uh, better electrical flow through well-hydrated skin, as well as uh, joint uh, support and things like that, even seven grams a day will do that for you. So you can basically take a spoon of collagen and put it in your, in your coffee. You can put it in soup. You can basically, it'll disappear into any hot dish. And that's the way a lot of people use it. If you're using it specifically as a protein source, which I certainly do, if I'm gonna do it, I'll do 30 grams, because you know I weigh a little bit more than 200 pounds, and I've got a lot of muscle. So the idea there is I wanna support that. Collagen's interesting because it's high in glycine, but it's low in cysteine and methionine and some of the other things. You get too much cysteine, like you would if you consume a lot of whey protein, more than the two tablespoons a day I recommend, even of upgraded whey that can trigger inflammation. So one of the reasons the Bulletproof diet is a moderate protein diet is that excessive protein triggers inflammation. Protein is a crappy way 
for you to get energy. You shouldn't be metabolizing energy. You shouldn't be metabolizing protein for energy. You should be metabolizing protein as a building block, and you should be burning fat and even starch or carbs to get energy for your cells. Like beta oxidation of protein generates ammonia and excess biological burden that just doesn't serve you. So then that goes back to your question, how many grams of protein do you need in order to build muscle? And the short answer to that is enough. And you can do this by testing. In the Bulletproof Diet book, I actually publish a range of things. So you want to eat the minimum amount of the least inflammatory protein that it takes for you to put on the muscle you want. And don't make the mistake a lot of bodybuilders will do by just cranking up the whey because of this cysteine problem and whey can be really irritating to the gut. So I would say use good quality animal protein like grass-fed meats, use eggs, and yeah, use collagen protein and use it intelligently. And that would mean that just crank up your protein, do the workout, see what works. And I think you can get there, but start with the guidelines in the book. Cool. I recently made a bone broth just last weekend with some grass-fed bones that I had. And that's really great. I love that, but it takes, you know, 12 hours and you got to do the whole thing. And so most of the time I'll just put a scoop of the collagen protein in and it's like, it's a nice little hack, you know? I, I almost wanted to call it instant bone broth, <laughs> but here's the thing. Bone broth, when you make it, it's, it's broken down by heat and you're getting uh, like good quality gelatin in bone broth. And you're also getting the minerals from the bones, which are not as present in, uh, in collagen, in the collagen protein that we make. Upgraded collagen, though, is processed by enzymes, so it's broken down, and it's not broken down by heat or acid like a, a typical gelatin would be. It's actually seven different cycles of, of enzymes that we use on it. So when you get that, it doesn't require digestion. And bone broth is also broken down, so it's very easily absorbable. It's kind of like juicing a cow when you think about it. But it, it's very interesting to, to think of what happens if you make bone broth to get the minerals and just the goodness of it, but then you add collagen to it and I if that's actually what I do when I make bone broth is like I double down on the collagen because if that's why you're having it you want to be able to do that to get more protein that way and yeah. benefits of the minerals nice all right the uh, the next question is from just G and she asks like OG or some other <laughs> yeah, she or he asks uh, can you talk more about the benefits of water with Himalayan salt in the morning I love Himalayan salt and water in the morning and I first heard about this through uh, Jim Wilson's is wrote like a very old book on adrenals. Like in fact, he was one of the first guys to point out adrenal fatigue. Like it's all the rage now. Alan Christensen's book just came out, The Adrenal Reset Diet. And the first guy to really say, oh, it's your adrenals was Jim Wilson um, going back like almost 15 years. And he talked about doing this as a way of healing adrenal fatigue. And what I started doing was using it as a way to prevent adrenal fatigue and to have more energy during the day. And found out from that that it's actually also an Ayurvedic thing that's been done for quite a while by some herbalists, uh, particularly going back into India. And what you do is you put about a teaspoon, sometimes more, sometimes less, enough that you don't get disaster pants. And you put it in water and you drink it as soon as you wake up. And it sounds a little bit gross, but it's not, it's energizing. And the reason for this is that as you're, you're working to wake up in the morning, there's this uh, circadian uh, diurnal spike in your cortisol. And the reason for this is really important. When it's time to get out of bed, if you don't have enough cortisol to support your blood pressure, you're gonna stand up. When you stand up, your blood pressure changes, you'll pass out. When you pass out, you could hit your head and then a tiger could eat you. Since this is bad for your ability to reproduce the species, your body's like, this is kind of an emergency because you're getting out of bed. So I'm gonna do what I need to do to change my sodium potassium ratio by generating more cortisol. Well, if it needed to make enough cortisol to raise sodium and drop potassium, what if you just step in and kindly help your body by increasing sodium so that your body can balance sodium and potassium more effectively? That's the idea behind this. And many, many people who've heard about this on Bulletproof are like, I feel noticeably more energy throughout the day. And that was my experience when I started doing that as well. Yeah, and personally, uh, I noticed a difference and I just take, I have a little thing of salt next to my bed and I just take like a small amount and wash it with water. I don't mix it with water. Personally, I don't you know, like the taste of that. So, so look at- Just as good or? If you're like really into the salt thing, everyone knows you make soleil, which is when you take like a, a crystal, preferably one that's been you know properly massaged, and you put it in, in a bowl, 
okay? And, and the bowl has to be like a special bowl. And then you like let the water percolate with the salt. And then you take two teaspoons of the salt, the salt water, and you mix it with the water. Seriously, this is in a book, I'm not joking, uh, on, on salt. <laughs> I tried it, and it did seem to work exactly the same as taking two pinches of salt, tossing it in my mouth, and drinking it down. But sometimes that burns your throat a little bit with the salt. But what do I do? That's what I do. I take a pinch of salt in the morning, and I put it in my mouth, and I just wash it down too, because it's just easier. But for people who don't, or people who have a problem with just like swallowing stuff, like I'll take big handfuls of vitamins too. I don't, I, I feel good about that. Um, having a little bit of it dissolved in the water ahead of time is actually just easier going down, and it can be less nauseating. That makes sense. Another sort of related question is from Alexander, who is curious about the notion of supplement cycling. Uh, what supplements do you take every day? Which ones get cycled? How often? And that sort of relates to adrenal fatigue, right? Um, with different substances or supplements that you may be taking. So do you cycle your supplements? And what well, do you recommend? We're, we're not robots. So taking the same supplements every single day forever, it, it's something that maybe new supplement users might do. And there are some supplements that I do take pretty much every day, but there's a bunch of them that I don't take every single day. And over time, I've become much more open about that. At the beginning of, of this, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I was like, okay, here's my spreadsheet. Here's, I'm actually gonna make these packets. I used to do this like, like a whole, Two or two weeks or a whole months worth. I'd get these like Monday through Friday, like like you know, when I was younger, I'd, I'd be like you know this is like old people pill things, right? And I'd put my little vitamins in there and I'd count them all out. And what what I found just from doing research is that vitamins interact with air, they interact with light, and they interact with each other. So that isn't really the ideal way to do it. And the other thing is that your requirements for vitamins they change every day. Right, so some days you need more vitamin C. And here's an example. Let's say that you have the amount of vitamin C you can absorb. And you can tell this with a really cool test. It's called the bowel tolerance test. You just keep taking vitamin C until you get disaster pants. And that's your number. That's as much vitamin C as you, quote, need. But here's the problem. Get on an airplane and fly somewhere and take that amount and take twice that amount and you probably could have used it start getting a cold and your ability to take vitamin C will go up dramatically and vitamin C only works it, it's actually um, a, uh, a very very steep dose response curve so you need to get really close to bowel tolerance for vitamin C to work years ago when I was just finishing 15 years of sinus infections I, I had these terrible things like every month I'd get when I'd go on antibiotics and I'd sworn I'm like I'm done with this I'm not going to take antibiotics anymore and I had a really strong sinus infection. So I went to a local, uh, a local physician and I said, look, I'm not gonna do it, I want, I want to work with you. This is an alternative functional medicine guy. So we did 100 grams of vitamin C intravenously, okay? It was that 100 grams is 100 large vitamin C pills, okay? And intravenous vitamin C is more potent than taking oral. On top of that, I took 75 grams of vitamin C capsules. That's 75 large capsules to try and reach bowel tolerance. I couldn't do it. So I went back the next day and I did another 100 grams of vitamin C intravenously and another 75 grams, I actually took those 75 grams throughout the day. And I still didn't reach bowel tolerance. The sinus infection did start to get better though. Right, and in fact, that was one of the really la the last really bad ones I had before I did some other protocols that, that helped me with it. So, how much vitamin C should you take every day? Well, are you sick? Are you stressed? And the same goes for things like adrenal glandulars. I take those things anytime I got less sleep than I wanted, anytime I'm traveling, anytime I've got any sort of jet lag issues or I'm gonna be uh, doing something that might make me wanna be more resilient than normal. But there are good studies that show antioxidant enzyme levels in the body are really important, and if you take antioxidants all the time, you can suppress your antioxidant enzymes. So the short answer here is what I do today is I have, and I know you guys are going to see this and I'm not going to show it to you and I'll tell you why. I have a, a shelf about this wide and this part of the shelf is like stuff I take in the morning. And yeah, there's unfair advantage and there's some other things that you would expect to be there. It's, it's some of my stuff. There's stuff I take with meals and it's a bunch of stuff that absorbs best with food. And then there's stuff I take before bed. And those are the three categories. And some of the stuff that I take with meals, I also take when I wake up and before bed, but I have a little part for that. 
And the way my brain works, I'm very spatial on things. So I just know like this part of the shelf is where I go. And I know what everything does. And I would encourage you, if you're serious about biohacking, is know why you're taking your supplements. Think about the day that you had yesterday and think about the day you're planning today and take the supplements that will increase your performance or increase your resilience. That's literally what I do. And the more you do that, the more connected you'll be with why you're taking these things and what they do for you. When I travel, I pick what I'm going to be doing and I say, all right, this is an intense trip. I'm going to be jet lagged. So then I put extra stuff. For instance, on this trip, I have three bags for every day. There's a bag of vitamins for the morning, bag of vitamins for one meal, and a bag of vitamins for going to sleep. And the little baggies, the little crack bags, um, the one, every one of them has four grams of vitamin C in a timer at least one. So I'm taking 12 grams of vitamin C a day because this is a relatively intense trip. In like 10 days, I'm doing three cities and I'm pretty much on 12 to 14 hours a day with interviews, with recording this. Uh, I've been on uh, Fox News on this trip and I'll be on stage in front of 100 health people later today at JJ Virgin's event. So like this is, an intense time, and that means I want to up my vitamin C. I know that wasn't the answer you were looking for. How should you cycle it? Don't cycle like a robot. Cycle like someone who knows what you did yesterday and knows what's happening tomorrow. And when you do that, you'll say, you know, this was a stressful day. Maybe I'll take more of my coenzyme A to B complex. And that's a healthy thing to do. And if you just don't feel like taking it, and you look at it and you go, meh, Honor the meh and just don't take it that day. It's okay. You're not a good person if you take your vitamins every day. You're not a bad person if you don't. Like those vitamins are there for you and you can use them to make your day better. That was, was that kind of a long answer? It was. It was great. Uh, I have two follow ups. One, for beginners who aren't as in tune or aware of what all those different vitamins do, and it's a little overwhelming to start. Do you recommend any of those blood tests that give you like the nutrition profile? They'll say, well, you're, you're low on vitamin D, things like that. That's the first question. Okay, so red blood cell mineral analysis can be really good. Um, they can tell you what's there, and they can also look at uh, what's going on with your fatty acids in your red blood cells, which can be kind of interesting, like shocking. People take too much fish oil. Right? It, it's, it'll dysregulate your cell membrane if you have too much fish oil. And I'm a fan of krill oil and all that stuff, but if you take masses of it short term, it can actually really help with inflammation. If you take masses of it long term, it can actually trigger problems. So yes, getting a quantifiable test there that looks at your B vitamin levels is, is also really, really useful. So totally spend the money on tests if you're new and you're willing to spend the money on tests. But if you don't have the money to spend on tests, that's okay. What you do is you take the list on the, the website, we'll put in the show notes, the 10 most important vitamins. It's pretty likely you're magnesium deficient. So taking some magnesium is a really good thing and it's very affordable. Vitamin D, affordable. Vitamin K2, not that affordable, but really, really critical to keeping your calcium where you want it. So these are things that pretty much everyone should do. The reason that I'm not gonna tell everyone, here's what's on my shelf, is that I weighed 300 pounds. I had toxic mold exposure, I had chronic fatigue syndrome, I had fibromyalgia, I had arthritis when I was 14, I have a unique genetic profile, I have, let's see, I don't methylate vitamins very well, and if I write that whole list of everything I do for all the reasons I do it, it is so customized after nearly 20 years of customizing my stack that people out there will go and copy what I do and they it won't work. You need to build the things that support your biology. That's why the Bulletproof Diet is a roadmap and a spectrum with free tools that tell you here's how to navigate the roadmap to get what works best for you because you're not a bad person if you enjoy white potatoes without the peels. You're just not, assuming that you're genetically okay with them. They make me itch and cause me, cause me joint pain. That's why they're a suspect food. The same thing is true of vitamins. One of the things I did early on, well, B6, vitamin B6 is good for you. Well, there's a problem with that. Excessive B6 is tied to peripheral neuropathy. This means numbness and tingling in your fingers and toes. I actually got this from excessive B6 a long time ago. So if you don't catch it in time and you keep taking the B6, it can be permanent. And it actually makes me a little bit scared when I see supplement companies just including vitamin B6 all willy-nilly because everyone knows it's good for you. But if you're taking like five different things and all of them have a bunch of B6 in them, you could have problems there. So be aware of the total you take from different vitamins as well. So, so bottom line is, there's a science to supplementing. I recommend blood tests, but don't do it just because I do it. Do it because your body and your day and your diet and your exercise and the amount of sleep you get and the amount of stress you're under, 
those dictate what you do and be quantitative with the blood tests if you can afford it. If not, go down the list for cost-benefit analysis. That's why the top 10 bulletproof supplements are there. Okay. <clears throat> My second follow-up question on that is something that I know is on a lot of people's minds. Why does everything that we talk about with biohacking and stuff cause disaster pants? <laughs> it's like it, we've mentioned like four different ways you can get disaster pants already on this podcast. Is that like... Why does everything cause disaster pants? <laughs> too much MCT or, you know, like too much it, vitamin C. Like. Yeah, it, it's, it's true. So your body is good at absorbing stuff, right? It'll absorb so much, but it's not that good at it, right? So one of the reasons that I do intravenous nutrition on occasion, like probably every time I go on a long trip, when I come back, if I can arrange it with local people where I live, and sometimes I'll stop by in New York and, and, and I'll see someone who does intravenous uh, vitamins. The reason you do that is that your gut can only absorb so quickly. And if you want to get extra vitamin C into the body beyond what the gut can absorb, you'll do it. And here's what happens. The gut's like, I wanted to bring this in. I brought in as much as I could. And what I do with what's left, you push it down. And if it's if it's irritating and the gut wasn't designed for basically the the large intestine to have this present in it, the body's like, oh, this is in the large intestine and it shouldn't be. Let's get it out of there. Thus, disaster pants. So it, it's kind of funny. It's one of the ways the body eliminates too much of something. And things like MCT oil, right? You absorb it, the body loves MCT oil. It goes through very quickly. It'll escort other things through, which is really, really cool. In fact, here's a cool study, one I haven't talked about yet. There's a, a study, from the top of my mind, I don't remember where it was done, but they looked at using what's in brain octane or XCT oil with cayenne and found a 50% increase in thermogenesis, which is kind of cool because cayenne itself can cause thermogenesis, brain octane and XCT oil can cause thermogenesis. So you put those things together, why? Because the oil helped the cayenne come in. Now I would caution you, cayenne is on the list of suspect foods for two reasons. It's one of the highest aflatoxin um, uh, harboring spices. 85% of people with Crohn's disease have aflatoxin present in their blood at higher levels. That's an interesting other study, so you might want to avoid it for that reason. Also, it's a nightshade, and if you're sensitive to nightshades, you can get autoimmune reactions from them. So take cayenne because it kicks ass. And take it with brain octane if you want to kick even more ass. So it's very nuanced, but you take too much of it and you're not going to have disaster pants. You're going to have hot disaster pants. That's even worse. So like, like watch out. So disaster pants is sort of like your, your body's own way of, of quantifying what you're doing. It, it's a strong signal that says, don't do that much again. <laughs> and, and Andy Nyla talked about putting cayenne in his bulletproof coffee and kicking it up a notch, and I tried that, and yeah. oh my gosh, like I've, it, I've it, done it too, it, and it, it really man, it, you sweat when you yeah. do it. Yeah, it's it doesn't taste good though. Is the problem? I, I don't appreciate. I it. like it actually. Do you? Yeah, I, I like it more like in a hot chocolate kind of thing. That that's that's more good. of a Mexican thing. Yeah. Cool. Well, that is going to wrap up part one of this Q and A podcast, and we'll be back probably later this week, uh, within a week, with part two. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Zach. Thank you.